Here are this morning's announcements. Have you experienced the deep grief of losing a loved one to death? Grief Share is a special weekly seminar and support group to help you rebuild your life after losing a loved one. Visit the Grief Share page on our website to register. Grief Share restarts this Tuesday, September 21st. Please contact Janet Chubb for more info. Calling all people who love to knit and crochet. You are invited to join the Prayer Shawl Ministry as it restarts this coming Thursday, September 23rd at 10 a.m. in the Admin Building Conference Room, which is WAB 105. This ministry will meet the fourth Thursday of every month. For more details, contact Maggie Kessler. Be our guest under the arbor for Family Movie Night happening this Friday, September 24th at 7 p.m. We will watch Raya and the Last Dragon. Popcorn and drinks will be provided. Please bring your own blankets and chairs. Contact Miss Jennifer Ingalls to sign up and get more info. Well, good morning. Let's stand. Let's sing together. Take all day, so I better start right now. And it might get loud. It might get loud. Heaven's coming down, down, down. And it might get loud. Somebody say it might get loud. Heaven's coming down, down, down. And it might get loud. No, I don't got a halo. A perfect woman. I'm just glad to be a child of God. When I think of what I could have been, should have been, would have been if you hadn't stepped in. I got a praise on the inside that can't be denied, and I gotta get it out right now. And it might get loud. It might get loud. Coming down, 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 and it might get loud. It might get loud. Heaven's coming down, 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 and it might get loud. Why can't I praise Him as loud as I want? Heaven's coming down, 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 down. Why can't I praise Him as loud as I want? Welcome this morning, whether you're joining us in person or online. We are so just grateful to be able to worship together, whether it's virtual or in person. At this time, we ask that you continue to stand and sing with us.
The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. I'm anointed to bring hope. The promise fulfilled in a moment. We're still watching it unfold. There's good news for the captive, a proclamation for every soul. This liberty is for the broken, an invitation to be made whole. This is for the free man singing, he's delivered me. Look out for the woman shouting, he's gone. Listen up for the seasons changing. He's rebuilding everything. Listen for the people shouting. This is Jubilee. Let's sing it again. The Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. I'm anointed to bring hope. The promise fulfilled in a moment, we're still watching it unfold. There's good news for the captive, a proclamation for every soul. This liberty is for the broken, an invitation to be made whole. Listen for the free man singing. For the woman shouting, his garment made me clean. Listen up, for the season's changing, he's rebuilding everything. Look out for the people shouting, this is Jubilee. This is Jubilee. Up. There's true. There is true joy in his freedom. So open your heart and receive it. There is a hope to believe in. Jesus, Jesus. There is true joy in his freedom. Open your heart and receive it. There is a hope to believe in. Jesus, Jesus. Good morning. morning. I want to welcome everybody to this time of worship. My name is Steve Autry. If I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, uh, I would love to do so after the service. I'll be available right up here. Of course, we've had the 815 service and then the outdoor service. So what I find at the outdoor service on a hot day like today is it's like a personal way to enforce social distancing. So you can... (laughs) I'll meet you up here, but you may want to stand away from me, and that's okay. I won't be offended, Uh, but welcome. We're so glad you're here. Thank you for gathering for worship. Uh, During our time of offering, just know that this congregation 
considers itself to be a part of our larger community. We do not do the work of Christ in this community alone. We partner with other churches and other organizations because we're better together and mostly because that's just how God wants it to be. Uh, last I checked, God didn't have, wasn't brand conscious and that God wanted people served in his name for his sake, whether that be a Baptist church, Lutheran church, Episcopal church, Methodist church, God cares about people. One of the ways that we serve uh, congregation, uh, people in this community is through those partnerships. Uh, here in a little bit, uh, not right now, but just in a little bit, you'll be hearing from Holly from Heartbeats who's going to be sharing with you about how we can help and how we do help partner with that great organization. But just know that when you give, your giving goes well beyond these walls. Yes, some of it goes to make sure the air conditioner is on, which I, for one, am very grateful for. Uh, but to keep the lights on, to pay staff, all those kinds of things. But also, a large part of your giving goes out to benefit the people who are not a part of this church. Because that's what God calls us to do. So thank you for your generosity. If you brought an offering with you today, you may simply drop it in the offering box in the back. Uh, or you may give online. Lots of ways to do that. If you're watching from home, and again, welcome to those of you who are joining us via live stream. We appreciate you being part of this worship service. There are all kinds of ways to give online. Um, and all those are available on the church website. But thank you for being a generous people. Thank you for giving back to God and to giving to God through the ministries of this church. Thank you. As you remain being seated, we ask that you continue to offer up your voice and your heart as we continue worship. Yeah. 
we sing that very last part again. Let's lift our voices together. No power of hell. No power of hell, no scheme of man could ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. Here in the power of Christ we stand. May I pray for us really quickly. Would you bow with me? Dear God, we just, we are just in awe of you, Lord. We're in awe of how wonderful you are. God, we know that you are for us. We know that you are not against us and you fight our battles and God, we know that there are many people in this room and at home joining us that are fighting battles right now. And God, we pray that you go before each and every situation that they are facing. God, we know you're mighty and you're capable. And we know the power of your name, Jesus. God, please take us through this time. Let us open our hearts and our minds to receive your word. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Earlier, we're going to hear from Holly Furches, who is the director of the Pregnancy Care Center here in our community. And I invite her to, to come, uh, come and tell us a little bit about Heartbeats, uh, all that you do. And you got to give it up to her. She's already heard me preach twice today. Uh, and um, and if she runs away after she speaks, you'll know exactly why. Because third, three times may just be too much. So, but thank you, Holly. Come and uh, share with us about your ministry and about the ways that we can and are involved in it. Yeah, I'm I'm getting a my full dose of church this morning. Uh, uh, an extra dose and then some. Uh, before I share, I do just want to take a second and say thank you. Um, I've said this every service, but thank you to Denver United Methodist Church. Um, Heartbeats loves you. Your, your church, your congregation uh, gives a lot to us financially um, with material donations. We have board members, we have staff members, we have volunteers that are part of this congregation. And so we are incredibly thankful to you. And not just the way you serve us, but the way you serve this community really well uh, is such an encouragement to us. So thank you for choosing to be the hands and feet of Jesus in this community. Uh, so at Heartbeats, I'm just going to share a little bit about what we do, why we do it, and how you might can partner with us. And so at Heartbeats, we serve um, men and women facing an un unplanned or crisis pregnancy. And, um, and we, we, we do that up until the child is the age of two. So that's kind of our niche. That's who we serve. And the services we offer are free pregnancy tests and ultrasounds. Uh, we have a medical director. We are a licensed medical facility. And we have um, licensed nurse, nurses. Our nurse manager is actually um, uh, someone who attends Denver United Methodist. And, and so they, they do free pregnancy tests and ultrasounds. This is really important because... Um, a verification of pregnancy is necessary in order for a mom to apply for pregnancy Medicaid and some other services that she might need or resources she might need. And so by eliminating that first cost for her, um, we're really helping to set her up for some of the other things that she needs. And so we do that at no cost. And then we do the ultrasounds, kind of the window to the womb, and allow moms and dads to see their child, to see uh, the heartbeat and to hear the heartbeat um, even at as early as six weeks in the womb. And we also have an education program. We call it B3. Our program director also attends here. And so uh, B3, we call it that because we want moms who attend our program, dads who are part of our program to be equipped, to be empowered, and to be embraced. 
And so we, we want to equip them with our program using parenting education, life skills, uh, learning how to make a budget and finances and all these things. We want to teach them how to be good parents, but also just how to live well. And so we equip them for that. We empower them with the resources that they need. We uh, we work with them, connect them to other nonprofits, other organizations, or, or even just resources like I've mentioned, like Medicaid and WIC and things like that. And then we want them to feel embraced. We want them to feel like they belong to a community where they matter and where they are loved. And so those are some of the big things we do. And then when they enroll in the program, then we provide material assistance. So diapers and wipes and strollers and car seats and cribs and clothes and all the things that comes with babies, which I have quickly learned is a lot. A lot comes with a baby. And that's actually why a lot of moms are so nervous about having babies is because they know that, that a lot comes with it and they know that they are financially not prepared to provide. And so we, um, we're able to meet that need. We also have a mobile unit. And maybe you've seen it. Um, it's very colorful. It's chill and lime green. So if you see it, you won't miss it, right? It's out and about every week. Uh, it's out twice a week. Sometimes at DSS, uh, we go to the uh, Gaston College in Lincolnton, some local churches it sits at. And uh, we do that because we want to go to where these women are. And uh, when we, uh, I actually was sitting on the board when we made that decision, and it was a really easy yes for us. Because we believe that we serve a God who uh, stepped out of the throne of glory and out of heaven and came into our mess uh, to be born as a child. And he entered our mess uh, to redeem, to seek and to save the lost. And this is the God that we serve. And so since our God has modeled this way of love for us, we could not help but be compelled uh, to love men and women in our community the same way. Not to just sit in our building, which was good right? But to get to where they are because a lot of them struggle with transportation. So we wanted to get to where they are so that we can meet their needs. So we offer free pregnancy tests and ultrasounds and um, mentoring on that mobile unit as well. So that's kind of in a small little pocket what we do. We also help uh, uh, homeless women try to find housing. There's bigger needs sometimes that we encounter and we work with them with case management and uh, kind of help get them on their feet. But the reason we do this is um, these are all good things. And uh, most people don't argue with us about that. These are good things. But we don't just do them because they're good things. We do them because we think they're God's things. We think that it's what God has called us to. We believe it's the mission of the church is to reach people who are in crisis, to reach people who are struggling. Um, in Mark, Mark says that Jesus, uh, he's, he's the great physician, right? And he didn't come for the healthy. He came for the sick. He came for those who are desperately in need. And so that's who we want to reach, uh, those who are without hope, and we want to give them hope. So we do what we do because at the end of the day, we want moms to make life-affirming decisions, but not just about physical life. We want moms and dads to be transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, to break the chains and the bondage of, of even generational cycles in their life of poverty and abuse and things of that nature. And we believe that there is nothing greater to break the, the bondage of those things than the gospel of Jesus and the work of Jesus in their lives. So when given the opportunity, when the Holy Spirit moves, um, it is our heart's desire to get to share with them the love of Jesus and the gospel of Jesus and that there's grace and there's mercy at the foot of the cross. And a lot of these moms come in with the weight of the world, shame and guilt, and they feel a sense of judgment. And when they enter heartbeats and they find that they are loved for who they are, and that we don't just love their baby, which we do, but we love them and we see them and their story matters, then God often opens the opportunity for us to not only let them know that we care, but that there's a God, a creator, God who made them in, their, in his image and that he cares for them. And uh, so that's why we do what we do, because we believe that God has called us to it. So how can you partner with us? Uh, there's a couple ways you can partner with us. You can volunteer. That's a pretty like uh, easy, tangible thing you can do. We take nurses. We take people who just help with organizational pieces. We take people who meet with our clients in our education program who are mentors, uh, mobile unit drivers, uh, things of this nature, board members. These are ways you can volunteer. You can give. You can give of your finances, give of your resources. 
Um, if it, you can donate diapers and wipes and all these things that we're giving out all the time. You can pray for us. Um, we, we, uh, we feel and sense uh, the prayers of God's people daily. Uh, as we encounter some hard situations, you can pray for our clients as they are facing um, some hard decisions and as they are struggling, pray for them. And, and you can participate in some of our events, our, our fundraisers, our community events, different things that we're doing. You can be a part of that. We also, in January, were gifted land to be able to build what I call our forever home because I hope it's forever. <laughs> We've been moving a lot in the last couple of years, and I, I'm, I'm ready to not be moving anymore. But um, when the time comes for that, if, if you have a skill, a, a trade that you, you could offer some of your services to help put in the plumbing or electrical or whatever it may be, that would be incredibly um, helpful to us. So there's a lot of ways that you, you can give to what God is doing at Heartbeats. And like I mentioned, a couple of events. So a couple of things are coming up really soon. So on September 26th, actually here in this room, um, that evening, I believe, uh, starting at 7 o'clock, we're holding a memorial service for the unborn. And so it, this past year, we've seen a lot of clients and a lot of women who have miscarried. And that's weighed very heavy on our hearts. And we've also um, talked with a lot of women who are dealing with um, some regret and some the grief that comes with abortion. And because we believe that life uh, begins at conception and that there's life in the womb when that life is lost, we also believe that moms and dads need the space to grieve that loss. And so on September 26th, um, we're going to be right here. Uh, Pastor Steve is actually going to be doing the message for that. Aaron's going to be doing some music for that. Um, and we're just going to give... Uh, moms and dads in our community a space to grieve. And maybe that's you. Maybe you've experienced a miscarriage or maybe you've experienced abortion and you're struggling with that. God wants to heal you from both of those things. He wants to usher in hope. And I hope that you would join us that night. And maybe you just want to come and just be a source of encouragement and support for the moms and dads who will be here grieving that night. We also have a fundraiser coming on October 15th at Divine Farms. It's just going to be kind of a fall fun festivity thing, all, all, all things fall, uh, food, live music, hay rides, corn maze, silent auction, uh, fun stuff. You can register on our website. This website also is where you can get a lot of good information about what we're doing and how you can help supportheartbeats.org, supportheartbeats.org. And if you follow us on Facebook, we're um, frequently posting just needs, even if it's a certain size diapers or certain size clothing, things of that nature. If you're interested in being able to meet those, those very tangible needs on a regular basis, you can follow us there and you'll know what those are. But thank you. I know I just said a lot, but thank you for listening to me. Thank you for having me here. Thank you for loving us well. Thank you for caring about this community and um, for not only uh, believing in the gospel, but wanting to live it out. Um, it's very important and it's very encouraging to us to get to see that from this local body. So let me set the context for where we are, both within the scripture and specifically the context that Jesus is speaking into. This is the 15th chapter of Luke, where Jesus tells three stories about items that are lost and found. 
The first being a lost sheep. Today we'll look at a lost coin. Next week we'll start with the story of a lost son that is better known as the parable of the prodigal son. Um, the, con- the larger context in the, as far as the audience he's speaking to is he's responding to criticism from the good religious folks of the day, the leaders of the Jewish faith, the scribes and the Pharisees in particular, who are grumbling about the fact that he is spending time with those people. And and the way they put it is, who is this fellow who eats with sinners? Um, Which means that Jesus is being criticized for being in fellowship with those who didn't measure up, to those who fell short according to the strict religious laws of the day. And so, in order to respond to this criticism, Jesus teaches these three stories. And at the heart of it, he's trying to get the audience, the scribes, the Pharisees, those good religious folks, to understand who God really is. See, they they thought they knew who God was, that God was uh, someone that you had to please by following all the rules and doing everything just right. And only those who followed all those rules and did all these ritual things could get close to God. And so Jesus is trying to correct their image of God. And so part of that correction, again, is this parable, the story or the parable of the lost coin as recorded for us in Luke chapter 15, verses 8 through 10. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The word of God for the people of God. God. Let us pray. Lord, I ask that you would open our hearts, minds, souls to what you have for us this day. And in the strength of the name of Jesus Christ, in the work of your Holy Spirit, may you speak to us what you would have us to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, when I get home, I'm going to watch football. I am so glad football season is back. Um, For a lot of reasons. I grew up loving football, playing football, all that kind of stuff. But football season... It's the only time of the year that my wife and I can watch the same thing on TV. See, along the way, we both became Panthers fans. Uh, I grew up a Washington Now football team fan. And when your team loses even their nickname, it's hard to pull for them anymore. Uh, They lost everything else. They might as well lose their nickname too. Uh, Last week, by the way, they had a sewer pipe break in their stadium. And raw sewage spilled out over the... um, (laughs) <laughs> the audience, that just sums up the fortunes of the Washington football team perfectly. So it's been relatively easy to become a Panthers fan over the years. And so for three hours, Marcy and I can watch the same thing on TV because the rest of the week we can't. Anybody else have this problem or is it just in our marriage that I like shows that she hates And she likes shows that I would rather pull my own teeth with pliers than watch. That's just how it is, at least in our household. And the thing is, um, not only does she not like watching what I watch on TV, but she'll pay just enough attention to it to mock me. I mean, I don't make fun of her for watching all that stuff on Lifetime and uh, and for, and I even let her, listen, I give her permission to even subscribe to the Hallmark channel around Christmas time. But yet when I'm watching something, she comes by and she pays just enough attention to make fun of it. Which I'm saying this because the Curse of Oak Island is about to come back on for the next season. And she will make fun of me for watching that. Anybody seen this show? It sucks me in. I'm, it, it does. It, it's this story about two guys, uh, two brothers, Rick and Marty Lagina. Uh, maybe I like it because they're brothers and they actually talk to each other. Uh, and 
that they are on a treasure hunt. And so they've, they've purchased most of Oak Island, which is a small island right off the coast of Nova Scotia. And they are trying to chase down a legend that a great treasure is buried on that island. And so the History Channel's had this on for nine seasons now. And so they, they do all kinds of crazy things. They, they bring in heavy equipment, which is awesome, right? They bring in these big drills and boring machines, and they send down divers into these holes, and they do all kinds of stuff. And they're looking for this fabled treasure. And every episode goes about just the same. You get this little, uh, and in the in industry, the film industry, it's called a MacGuffin. It's a little teaser to make you think they found something. So they'll give you a snippet and they go, and somebody will look surprised, and somebody will pick up something and go, oh, and then they'll cut away. And then the narrator says, could it be Rick and Marty have at last found the key to the treasure? You know, it always ends with a question. Um, one of the hilarious things about the Curse of Oak Island is uh, there are even some people who come on to say that the Ark of the Covenant has to be buried there. Isn't that funny? I'm sorry. Uh, Billy, do I need to switch to this? That may be helpful. I, something seems to be shortened out. Evidently, uh, we'll just switch over to this one. I'll cut this one off, see if that helps. Because I know I'm hard enough to listen to, <laughs> even when the microphone's good. Um, but they'll say, like, even some people think that, you know, they come on, they bring these people and say, oh, it must be the Templars have buried their treasure here, right? No one even heard of the Templars more than 60 years ago, or at least until 20 years ago when Dan Brown wrote about them. And then, well, the Ark of the Covenant, could it be buried on Oak Island? Which is absolutely ridiculous because everybody knows Indiana Jones already found the Ark of the Covenant. But my wife, she'll watch just enough to look at me with that, I can say nothing other than condescending look that, by the way, only comes when you go have gone to school at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. That was a shot, by the way, in case you missed that. And she'll go, you know they're not going to find anything because they never have. And I want to say, mm, but she's right. She's right. <laughs> so I will waste the number of hours of my life watching them not find something again this fall. But I'm a sucker for a treasure hunt. The, the idea of finding something that was lost that has enormous value. It really does happen that people find lost treasures. Um, Mel Fisher, anybody ever heard of the name Mel Fisher? He found, back in I think it was 1985, a shipwreck of a Spanish galleon called the Atosha. This was a ship that was part of a larger treasure fleet uh, that Spain had sent to take the gold from Central America, ship it back to Spain. Um, he found half of one of those ships called the Atosha. And he found $400 million worth of gold bars, coins, silver, artifacts, emeralds. And I saw that TV show as a kid, the documentary of him finding that, and I was hooked. I was like, wow, uh, sign me up. I'm going to go look for lost treasure. I would spend my time being a treasure hunter if I had any clue as how to do it. I have to say, when I've been to the Florida Keys and down around the, the coast of Florida, close to where that shipwreck was found, I, I walked through the sand like this. Anybody ever do that? Just thinking, maybe I'll stump my toe on a treasure of some kind. Um, you know, I've never found anything worth anything on the beach. But I still look. But this idea of searching and finding something that was lost that has enormous value, well, it, it sucks me in every time. What, what Jesus is talking about here is about finding something that was lost. And the interesting thing about the way Jesus tells the story, it's not a treasure hunt. It's not. It's a rescue effort, right? Because the sheep, you know, it starts with 100 sheep, one's lost. The shepherd had possession of the, of the sheep previously. If the sheep is lost, that's not a treasure hunt. That's a rescue effort. This woman who has 10 coins, 
She used to have all ten. She loses one. And so as she searches for it dil- diligently, that's not a treasure hunt. It's actually a rescue effort. And what Jesus is doing is trying to get his hearers in that original context, but also, I believe with all my heart, us, to understand who God really is. What's God like? What are God's characteristics? And so the characteristic that God, of God that is on display today is of someone who conducts rescue efforts. Someone who, who launches into search and rescue mode. Who almost recklessly goes into search and rescue mo- mode. As far as the, the case of the 99 sheep are concerned. Remember last week we talked about them not being put away in the sheepfold. They're at risk because he goes and looks for the one. That's who our God is. Someone who will come looking for us. Who will come to find that which was part of his family previously. Now, he, Jesus would have really gotten the attention of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes with this story. See, when he's talking about God being like a shepherd, well, yeah, plenty of references in the Old Testament about God being like a shepherd. In particular, you can find those in Isaiah and Ezekiel. Of course, David was the great shepherd king, and the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. So that wouldn't have been any stretch of the imagination for them to let that sink in. But then he goes from talking about God being like a shepherd to saying this, or a woman. Uh, They would have sat up and been like, what did he just say? As one of the prayers of the Pharisees was something along the line of daily giving thanks to God for having made them a Jew and then thanking God for not making them a woman. You know, that's if you think my wife and I have disputes over TV, that prayer wouldn't do me any favors to pray with her, would it? Or my two daughters. Now, what Jesus is doing is pushing their understanding of who God is because God naturally has to be beyond whatever we are. Genesis says very clearly, Two creation counts in Genesis. One where you, the older one, the ancient one, the one that's, that seems to be in circulation the longest, Adam and Eve. But then the, there's another, if you pay attention, where it talks about, and God created them, male and female, he created them in his image. Yes, we use the pronoun he for God. We call God Father because that's what Jesus did. But if you think about it, God's got to be beyond all of that. And so Jesus is pushing the Pharisees' understanding of who God is. And I imagine they didn't like it very much. So um, they were already mad at him. What's he got to lose, right? But he goes on to say, God, or like a woman, who, having lost the coin, doesn't search her house. And how does she go about searching for it? With diligence. She lights a lamp. She sweeps. She has to work at it. That's what's interesting to me. Now, when I lose something, especially something, if I were to lose, let's say, a quarter, which is the large, largest denomination of coin I typically carry, I probably wouldn't go to much trouble to look for it. I just probably wouldn't. Uh, some of you would because you're just that tight. That was supposed to be funny. You can laugh at that. Make me feel better. But... What I usually say, if I lose something that isn't, like, super valuable, oh, it'll just turn up. Anybody ever use that philosophy with trying to find things that you may not need immediately? Oh, don't worry about it. It'll turn up. Um, I'm I'm not going to tear down the house for that cheap pair of sunglasses because, well, they'll turn up somewhere, and they almost always do. That's a passive way. That's just sitting back and hoping and waiting, knowing, yeah, chance encounter, I'll find it. What we get in this story is not a chance encounter. It's an active, vigilant image of searching. To go to the trouble of lighting a lamp. To sweep the floor. And one of the interesting things about this, and I'm going to give credit to Owen because he was in small group. He said, you know, uh, we were talking about the scripture this Wednesday night. And he said, you know, it would have been a dirt floor. Think about that. 
It wasn't like it just, she could just get out the vacuum and vacuum the house and then empty the vacuum bag. She had to look, search. Lamps only cast so much light, especially the lamps in the first century that you actually had to light. So it's an image of very meticulously, methodically, shout out to Methodism there, uh, searching for that coin. I can imagine her sweeping a little bit, searching, sweep a little bit more, searching, sweeping a little bit more, you know, holding that lamp up every step of the way until that coin is discovered. Now, what's interesting is in that active pursuit, it's a way of saying, and I believe it's a message directly from Scripture that says, our God is an active God, not a passive God, not a God that just sits back and sees how things will turn out or turn up, but rather a God that is engaged in the search. I, I know it feels like sometimes that God is <laughs> far away. You ever feel that way? Yeah. You ever feel like, look at the, the events of the world. Look at all the, the division, the anger, the brokenness in our world. I mean, we have political issues. We have uh, economic issues. We have racial issues. We, we've got issues. You ever look at all of that and you want and wonder, where are you, God? Where are you? I, I, I mentioned this in the 815 service, and I said, you know, sometimes it feels like the world's gone to hell in a handbasket. And I actually got an amen. I mean, I've been in Methodist church for been a pastor for 25 years. I've never got anybody to give me an amen. Um, I about fell out of the pulpit. And by the way, that's our quota for amens for the year. So we get one a year. So anyway, but think, doesn't it sometimes feel that way? Look that way from the outside? I mean, the eyes of cynicism say that. God, you don't care. God, you're distant. Maybe you feel that way in your own personal life. And, and that can happen when you're struggling with relationship issues. Some of you are there right now. Some of you have things in your families that are just ripping you apart. I mean, families have been torn apart over this response to COVID-19 even. Families are each other's throats over whether they're vaccine or not vaccinated. That's a real thing. It's tearing apart communities. Uh, do you ever have struggles in your work? And you go, God, where are you? For those of you who are still in school, have you ever had issues in school? And you're like, God, where are you? What are you doing? Or do you even care? It, it's easy to think of God as being passive and distant and uncaring. And that's how come sometimes we get that image of God being this, this old man who sits on a cloud who doesn't have anything to do with creation. But that's not the image God, Jesus gives us Jesus says God is an active God, a God who will search diligently, who will get down into the muck of the dirt of the floor and sweep it up and look for that coin. Why? Because that coin has value. That coin has immense value. In Jesus' day, that coin would have been worth somewhere the equivalent of $2,000. Now, if I lost $2,000 in my house, I would tear it apart looking for it. What Jesus is saying is, that which God seeks has value. And if you notice in Luke chapter 15, the value gets more and more and more. We start with one out of 100 sheep, right? Even I can do that math. That's 1% of the total assets of the shepherd. For this woman, 1 out of 10. That's 10%. Next week, when we start with the prodigal son, he's going to be talking about 1 out of 2 sons. 
It's, it's fascinating the way the value gets more and more and more because the message that Jesus is trying to get home to his audience then and now is that people matter. Lives matter. You matter. And yes, there are times when it's hard to see that God is at work. I think about this story. This woman searched. She didn't call in her neighbors to help, did she? She did the searching. The neighbors were probably going on about their lives, had no idea that the woman had a search and rescue effort underway in her own home. They wouldn't have known she was working so hard. It's only when she finds it that she throws the party. It's only after she finds it that she invites them into their joy, into her joy. What this means for us is that we don't always see God at work. And yes, I know it is hard sometimes to see God at work. But we are called to believe that God is at work. Jesus says in the Gospels very clearly that the kingdom of God has drawn near. And he says something along the lines of, let those who have ears, let them hear. Let those who have eyes, let them see. Which means that we have to look for it. Because it is there. God has not abandoned this world. God has not stepped away from creation and God's not distant from creation. Rather, God is intimately connected to creation through the strength of the Holy Spirit, through the witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the active presence of God Almighty through it all. God is close and God cares. He cares for you, cares for me, and he cares for those who've who are outside of the fellowship, especially, especially, which matters that ministries like Heartbeats are active, reaching people, which matters that we engage in these acts of outreach to share God's love and goodness back out into our community, which matters that in your own personal witness and your own personal sphere of influence that you have, that you share God's love. However God calls you to do that. Because people need to know that our God is a God who values the lost and wants them desperately to be found. God is close, not far away. And you are invited to be a part of all that God is doing. And so when you leave here today, through the eyes of faith, the heart of faith, Step into a place of trust to know that God is working. God's not passive. And God always wins. In the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you all to stand as we pray together. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word that shows us who you are. It shows us that you are a God who values life, a God who values us, a God who values those who are part of his family and wants all to be an active part of that family. May we be faithful to be a part of your good news. We pray that as we go into this week that you would give us the eyes of faith to see, the ears of understanding to hear, and the hope within our heart to experience your goodness and be a sign of your good news back to the world. Lord, we thank you for all of this in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Now I invite you to go with the love, the grace, the hope of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Go with his power, his strength, his blessing this day in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And as I said earlier, I will be up here if anyone would like to speak to me after the service. And Holly, if you would just stay up here too. Come up to the front. If anyone wants to talk to Holly about the ministries that she's a part of, you're welcome to engage her right up here in the front. Thank you. Have a great week.